done. Perfect. It's queuing up now to be off that. Hey, good evening and welcome to the business meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. Tonight is Thursday, November 19th, 2020. Could I have the roll call vote, please? I'm sure. sorry, roll call attendance. <laughs> Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cavalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Here. Ms. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Mr. Bennett? And Ms. Giftis? Here. Excellent. Thank you. Um, agenda item 2.0 is adjustments to the agenda. I do have one adjustment to the agenda this evening. Um, I would like to move agenda item 5.0 Scarborough Education Foundation update um, to above agenda item 4.0, which is the superintendent report. Um, we have a guest joining us tonight and for the purposes of her time, um, I know it's been a long work day for her. We'll go ahead and get her in above um, some of our other business. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Agenda item 3.0 is public comment on agenda items. If you would like to make a public comment, please feel free to raise your blue hand and I can promote you into the meeting. Okay, I'm not seeing any public comment this evening. Agenda item 4.0, Scarborough Education Foundation update. And Kelly, if you could please share the slide deck for this evening. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and promote Ms. Dewitt. Oh, she's gone. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Except for I don't have my camera going. Okay. And if Michelle, if you want to just introduce yourself, um, and then you can take it away with your slides. Yeah. 
Okay, can you guys um, hear me okay? See me okay. All <laughs> right, great. Um, am, I, am I able to advance the slides or do I need you all to do that? No, nope, Kelly will go ahead and do that for you. Great. Okay, well, good evening. Uh, I am Michelle Duest. For folks who don't know me, I am the current president of the Scarborough Education Foundation. And I'm joining here tonight to give you a quick update on what we've been up to this year. Um, but before I get into kind of what's been happening with Seth this year, I just wanted to take a few minutes to kind of just step back and talk a little bit about Seth's mission and vision. I know a lot of you are really, really familiar with uh, the Scarborough Education Foundation, but for folks who might not be as familiar with Seth and what we're about and what we do, or folks who are in the community listening, uh, I thought it might be worth just stepping back and talking a little bit about who we are and what we do. So you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. So we'll talk about mission and vision. Um, I'm also wanted to give a little update on our current, current board of directors. There's been a lot of change actually in our board. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've been doing this year and that's uh, the SEF is meeting the moment agenda item and then um, touch on how you can help support SEF. So next slide. So our mission really is uh, very simple. Um, Scarborough Education is Education Foundation is really about connecting the generosity of our community with the creativity of our educators to invest in hopefully improving the learning outcomes of uh, Scarborough students. Uh, you can advance to the next slide. The way that we get there is simply through funding teacher grants. Um, and so when I think about CEF, I think the easiest way to describe it is that we are really seed money. And so if we have an educator who has a great idea, something creative that they wanna try out, something that falls outside of normal budget um, considerations, either because it's something new and innovative that they wanna try, or because it's a one-time investment and they're still trying to figure out if there's some um, you know, positive outcomes from it. CEF is a path that educators can use to um, get some funding and, and make that idea come to life. Since inception, CEF has funded over $220,000 in educator grants in uh, Scarborough Public Schools. One of the things that um, we have been working on enhancing in particular this year is really kind of closing the, completing the loop where not only will we um, help provide funding for creative ideas, but this year we're also um, uh, making sure that we follow that grant implementation through to the end. And so we've actually assigned um, grant liaisons to, uh, so it's basically a board member is assigned to each funded grant to follow through and follow up with that teacher and say, how did it go? What were the outcomes? And that's something else that we hope to provide as well is that we can provide some outcome data and just have you know an additional data point that hopefully will feed into the education system and future decision-making. You can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, um, I wanted to also just touch on our current board of directors. Um, so Michelle Duest, I am the president of CEF. Um, we have Andrea Byron, who is our vice president and grants chair. Colleen Amon, um, she's relatively new to the board and she's our fundraising chair. John Ducey, um, who is our treasurer and finance chair. David Martin also is um, very new to the board. Uh, uh, Amanda Morin, who is our marketing and communications chair and Kristen Roy, who is our secretary. And one of the things I wanted to mention about our board of directors, um, especially if you've known Seth for a while is that our 
our composition or our board of directors has changed quite a bit in the last few years. Um, Seth is, has been around for a while, but we haven't been around that long, um, really in terms of the maturity of the foundation. And this year, actually, I believe is the first year that none of the board members are um, founding, founding members of the foundation. So we've had a lot of change and that's been great. That's been exciting. I think a lot of fresh faces and new people kind of come to the table with some fresh ideas. And also just to put out there that we're always, um, you know, looking for new people to join the board. It's still a pretty small board. Um, so we'd love to have more people involved. So if people in the community are interested in getting involved with Seth, um, please reach out either through our Facebook page or our uh, website. You can go to the next slide. So this year obviously has been a very interesting year for everyone. Um, and Seth, I mean, probably what we're most known for is our uh, spring fundraiser which is we call our operation graduation fundraiser. That's where we sell balloons uh, to celebrate graduating seniors. This is actually you know, one of our biggest fundraisers of the year. And so this past spring obviously was a very unusual time and we were really happy and excited that we were able to figure out a way to still have this fundraiser and still maintain this tradition for our graduating seniors. Um, and it was extremely successful fundraiser for us, which was awesome. Um, there was a lot of outpouring from the community, people wanting to find a way to celebrate graduating seniors. Um, and this was, this is a way that they could do that. We raised over $15,000, which like I said, is, is definitely our most, um, most successful balloons fundraiser ever. And what that enabled us to do is that then when we came into the fall, um, and obviously it's still a crazy time and we were you know, wondering how can Seth you know, help our educators during this very unusual time, um, we really took a step back and just thought about how can we flex? You know, how can we help uh, support our educators through, through this unusual year? And we were able to actually get some time with Monique, which was wonderful because obviously it's, she was stretched so thin, but she spent a little time with us just brainstorming, what do our educators really need right now? And how can Seth use the resources that we have to help support them? And what we came up with was that what, you know, what our educators really needed was they needed um, they needed an avenue to, if they have a creative idea, that they can get that funding when they need it. And so we basically changed up our grant cycle this year. Normally we have a twice a year grant cycle where we just do grants in the fall and there's a, there's a grant cycle in the spring. And so we changed up that process to be a rolling grant cycle throughout the year. And with this great fundraiser, we were set up so that we could you know, offer that flexibility um, where teachers could apply for grants and we will review them as they, uh, as they come in. So basically we can get teachers what they need when they need it. You can go to the next slide. So how can you help support Seth? We basically, we have two things coming up. Um, the, first, the first is our annual appeal. So we are kicking off our annual appeal on Giving Tuesday, which is December 1st. And so we're just out there getting the word out and just, you know, asking people to please think about Seth on Giving Tuesday. Please add us to your list of foundations and nonprofits that you're planning to donate to. Um, last year, we had 100% participation from the school board and from school leadership or superintendent. And um, so we're hoping that you, know, you guys will support us 100% again this year and we'll have great participation. And, 
we're hoping that you can help us just spread the word to, to get, um, you know, put us on your list for annual appeal and please donate uh, to Ceph. This is actually, our annual appeal is our largest fundraiser of the year. So balloons is a big one, but this is actually a, a bigger one for us. And again, it, you know, a successful annual appeal is really, is what will help set us up to continue to offer that rolling grants option through the spring. Um, so getting the word out on annual appeal. And then the other um, avenue we have for folks to get out there and support us in December is um, the Lumington Christmas Village. Um, so we're gonna be there volunteering on Sunday, December 20th. Um, it's obviously very difficult to do any kind of events this year, but this was an opportunity where we were able to uh, successfully or safely volunteer at the Christmas Village and we'll be there accepting cash donations. They're going to set it up to make it safe um, so that people, I think there's gonna be like a bucket with a pole on it or something so people can safely make donations. So we will um, be there as well. So that's how you can help support us. So that was it. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Go ahead, Sarah. Michelle, are you guys, uh, first of all, thank you for that presentation. Um, are you guys set up on as a donor on Amazon for like the smile.amazon, you know? We are not, but we probably should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's super easy, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, if you if you do that, let me know, and we can we can put out a campaign to like get people to change theirs. I don't think it's much, but considering how much people shop on Amazon, I'm sure it adds up. Yep, definitely. Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michelle, for coming and giving an update, and we wish you all the best as we enter into hopefully what is a generous season. Yes, I hope so too. Thank you. Thank you. April. Yes, Felicia. Can you promote Max? I am actually not a host. Um, and so that was, I was going to ask um, either Diane or Kelly if they can do that for me. I just did. You should be along. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, agenda item 5.0 is the superintendent's report. Thank you, and Kelly, if you could bring up those slides. All right, so I'd like to uh, talk about weather conditions and snow days and provide some information on that. We did a survey in the last week, and what we'd like to do is just kind of walk through the three or four slides. First slide in front of you is on school days, with inclement weather conditions, do you have concerns that your child's teachers may not have connectivity? And so if you look on the left side, the family responses, and on the right side is the staff responses. And again, where, where I try to, try to make sense of this, and I, I've looked at this quite a bit, so I'm, I'm not gonna rush through this slide. I, I know you need some time to look at this. But um, on the family sides, 28.5% uh, said no, they're not overly worried about that. And um, on the yes side, it was 26.3%. And then the maybes were 45.1%. So again, almost half the population with the parents are sort of almost in the maybe component area. And then um, I would say the yes and the no's are pretty close together, you know, Pretty much 28% no and 26% yes. And then on the staff response, um, what we have here is the maybes are 32.3% and the no's are 32.7%. And I'm sorry, I'm just, there we go. Couldn't read the right side, so I just get rid of my face there. And on the right side is 35% yes. So again, um, if, you, if you're looking at 
the maybes and the nos, you know, you're probably around 64, 65% um, who are either vacillating between yes and no, maybe, and certainly some no's there. So I, this is just trying to give people a sense of what people are thinking about our snow days. And if we could go to the next slide, that would be great. Sandy, before you move on, could I ask a question? Sure, okay. Um, could you um, give us a little bit of context in terms of when the survey was sent out, how many respondents we had, who it was sent to, like those those kind of things, just so you know, people yeah. on board are clear. So we went out last week, and um, if I'm not mistaken, I think we had, well, I think we had like 3,800 plus responses. Um, we ran it pretty much all last week. And we actually put it into the newsletter as well, the Friday newsletter that goes out from the um, superintendent's office. And that was an opportunity to get more, more um, people to uh, chime in on this whole topic. So that it ran for about a week and uh, we had a really good response. And um, again, the, what I've learned in my years it's, it's always been kind of all over the map. Everybody has a different opinion about snow days. And I just thought it would be good to try to get the pulse of both uh, the community and with staff as well. Thank you. Yes. Next slide, please. So on school days, when we are looking at, um, again, the weather conditions, um, do people have concerns about the potential of losing power at their home, given like past experiences? Um, so when you think about this, this is sort of where I have had concerns in the past. And I have strong feelings about making sure that if, if we're going to have school that all students can connect. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But on the left side, the family response was maybe at 32.9%. And the yeses were 27.6%. And the noes were almost at 40%. So again, when you look at families, um, just to summarize, almost 28% said yes, and then the maybes and the noes. Uh, we're looking probably to combine those together, you know, around 82, 83%. Uh, and again, the maybes could fall in any type of category. So I, I don't want to have any bias with this. I, I just think that people are sort of up in the air when they say maybe, and, and maybe it will fall either way. On the right side is the staff, and we're looking at 35%. 0.4% who said no, and almost 25% who said maybe, and then 397 who said yes. So uh, particularly, I think the staff responses um, have a little more concern in this area, and, uh, and um, rightfully so. You know, they're the ones that will be teaching remotely, and uh, certainly that's a concern as well. So I can go on to the next slide. On school days, we're looking at weather conditions. Um, and again, would it be permissible? And uh, looking at the family responses, um, pretty good response on remote learning, just over 67%. And certainly, the other side was with no school around 32.5%. And with staff responses, um, it was really pretty close, I mean, right down the middle. And uh, I've had a lot of feedback from staff, particularly who are concerned about this topic, um, but just really worried about the, the ability to do remote learning on a snow day. So again, um, there's many factors that go into this as we will be talking about this. Okay, I think that's the last slide, Kelly. And 
what I'd like to do is just kind of summarize a little bit here some of my feelings about this and my thinking and where I would like to go with it. Um, so I just want you to picture, you know, in the morning, usually around 4, 4.30, we try to begin to make a decision about snow days. And uh, a lot goes into it. I coordinate my time with other superintendents in Cumberland County. Um, certainly I'm talking to people, uh, particularly in the district, um, we talk to public works and at times we talk to the police and we just try to make the best decision that we can. Um, I am worried about the ability, given the diversity of our town and the region that, you know, North Scarborough, South Scarborough, can you guarantee that all people will have electricity and be, all students will be able to connect? And what I don't want to get into is a haves and haves not. And, you know, certain kids can't get online, particularly teachers as well. You could have teachers that might work in one part of the district or live in the part of the district and they don't have power. Or we have many staff that commute from other towns and they could be in a position that uh, they, they have worse conditions and electricity is not available to them. And again, I'm thinking as an educator, when you're at five, six o'clock in the morning and you're thinking, okay, I gotta go to school. I gotta make sure I can teach my students. Um, and if you don't have the ability to either, either drive to work and have school, or if there's no school and you have any electricity in your house, I think it would be a concern about how could you educate remotely to those students. Um, I also, and I don't want to exaggerate this, but I think we're in a very different time and I think uncertain times. And there has not been probably an educator, and I respectfully say this, that has not said it's been very stressful. And that's both in the district and outside of the district. And I think educators have worked incredibly hard and I'm just overly worried that we could set up even more frustration and stress with our teachers and students and families at times, um, knowing that if we get hit hard with a snowstorm and we don't have the electricity, that could cause some problems. I have to say that, you know, looking at the data in Scarborough, you typically could have probably three if not four snow days on the average, just looking at the last seven or eight years. Um, and we would make up these days. My recommendation is if we had snow days that um, we would make them up at the end of the year. And that would be something that we would want to uh, make sure we stress with people. And so I'm at the, I'm just, Again, I'm at a place where I was probably two or three weeks ago where I, I just don't want to set up um, any situation where it's not equitable for our students. And I don't want our staff to be more frustrated that they can't get online. And we're not talking about a district that has 10 snow days a year. We're talking probably average three and we could make those up at the end of the year. So I would like to stay marching forward where we will have snow days. I would recommend that we continue to learn about remote learning. If you think back in March of last year and compared to the work that we're doing now with remote learning, we're even getting better at that. And I think the more we continue to learn about remote learning, I think in a year or two, this district may want to look at remote learning. Once you feel like, okay, we're not in this COVID period, we're a little more relaxed, we've got a lot of experience with remote learning, I think it might be another topic that you wanna bring up. I'm just not in any way in a position right now to, um, to think that we could go that route at this point in time. I think that's pretty much what I have to say about uh, some of these. Thank you, Sandy. 
Um, I'll start off by saying I very much appreciate that you um, took a data approach for us. Um, we asked you to gather some more information and to so that we weren't just making an anecdotal, um, you know, just so that you weren't making an anecdotal decision um, and that it was something that we could have an informed discussion about. So I appreciate um, your willingness to reach out to the community and to and to get some more information for us. Um, with that being said, I also used the time between last meeting and this meeting to reach out to a few people to, I think sometimes we have a question of authority um, and just wanted to make sure that this is not something that the board would take action on, but this is certainly something that we can discuss as a board. Um, and so it's my feeling so that the board knows um, that this is Sandy's discretion to call a snow day a snow day. Um, and to make that call at 4.30 in the morning as he has traditionally done. Um, and I think it's, you know, Sandy has made it fairly clear what his recommendation is, but I'm certainly open to hearing other comments from board members. Um, and so Alicia, your hand is raised and then Nick. Well, I, I, I would like to um, discuss it a little bit more, including that wrinkle that you just threw in, which is inconsistent with my recollection of the conversation that we had last week, that this was an actionable board item. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that after reaching consensus last week that we should be just sort of changing that. Um, but but um, my question was, I couldn't understand if, the, if Sandy was saying that these um, snow days would or would not be made up this year. Sure. They would be. They, they would, would be made up. Yeah. At the end of the year, we'd have to tack them on. Okay. So the rules are not different this year. If 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 there's a snow day this year, um, and it's and there's no learning going on, um, they would be made up with our regular hybrid. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm actually also very grateful that you, you talked, Sandy, about making the days up because, uh, as we all know, our academic calendar is pretty thin at 175 days as it is. So making them up is, is really crucial. Um, I've given this some thought, and the, and the only thing I wanted to just share with the board is, is a couple of things. One, well, first I'll say I, I agree with the superintendent's uh, recommendation and perspective at this point. I, I feel like people have so much change and so much going on right now. If we can keep one thing the same, um, I, I feel like that's a benefit to families and, and to have a snow day where everyone can take a breath, students can take a breath, and people aren't scrambling to snow blow the driveway and start the generators so that their computer can get fired up if they lose power and all that stuff. I feel like if we can give them that element of consistency, it's definitely worth researching in the future. Right now, I just feel like there's so much change coming our way, not by choice, that if we can choose to keep one thing stable, it, it might really help our families. So that was just my perspective. So to go back to your um, comment, Alicia, I certainly don't mean to be inconsistent. Um, I've, I'm learning. Um, and so, you know, one thing that we that we and I struggle with is what is a board decision versus what is something that Sandy presents to us that then is or isn't an action item. And so last meeting when it was presented to us, I did say that if it was something that was an action item, we could put it on a further agenda or future agenda rather. Um, but in talking with MSMA, um, you know, it, it, the, the opinion of MSMA was that it was not something that would be an action item of the board. Go ahead, Alicia. Sorry, I muted. So um, I think last time we discussed this, I, I understood him to say that they, the days were not going to be made up. Um, so Regarding the procedure of it, I do think that um, I disagree with MSMA because this isn't about whether we're calling a, he's called, the superintendent's calling a snow day or not. It's about what it's about how we're going to provide education to the students of Scarborough during snow days. 
And I think that that's an entirely different question. And that I do think is within the purview of the board, whether we're involved in remote learning or in-person learning and whether we're gonna, um, what, and that also impacts the, the calendar, the school calendar. So for those reasons, I, I, I disagree. If it was about calling the snow day, I totally agree, but um, um, I, I do think that this should be an action item. Um, I, knowing that the days are going to be made up now, if they're a full snow day, then I would support a full snow day because I think that provides the greatest educational opportunity for the students. And I also think it, um, it takes care of all of the other concerns. Um, but even though my, even though my um, opinion now is consistent with Sandy's, I still am, as you know, um, a procedure geek. And I, and, I, and I do think that the board should vote on it. And I don't know how, how that happens today, given that it falls under the superintendent. That's my pitch for it. So I, I, your point is well taken, Alicia. I do think that there is a difference between redefining what a snow day is and whether or not MSA was of the opinion that Sandy can continue to call snow days. Those are two, you know, different questions. Um, and so really what we need to decide as a board is if there was a temperature and you're right, if there was a consensus to redefine what a snow day was, then that to me is what the board action um, would require. If we are all in agreement that Sandy um, can continue to call snow days that will be made up, to me, it sounds as though we are not interested in redefining what a snow day means for this academic year. Um, and therefore, I don't, I don't think that there's an action that needs to be taken. Sandy, go ahead. I mentioned that the last time that we talked about snow days, the state did put um, a waiver in until like, I'm thinking it's around January 25th. So if we have a snow day up to, again, it's either January 25th or 27th. January 15th. That could be waived, but they have not extended that out into the whole winter at all. So I just wanted to clarify that. And to that point, um, I do think that if we had an excess of snow days, um, or even if we don't, even if we have two snow days, um, it's certainly within the board's purview to change the school calendar um, to make those days up, even if um, the current status set, you know, says that we don't have to. I think the board could elect to make those two days up, certainly, if we wanted to. So that's something that we could look at, you know, as the year goes on and, and can be dependent on how many days we've had and, and what the rest of the year, you know, really looks like. Does anyone else have comments? Okay. Um, moving on to agenda item 5.2 is the K-8 calendar update. Yeah, so what I'd like to talk a little bit is about the calendar. Again, it's K through eight. And um, what, again, part of our learning this year is that uh, we need time to, to really plan ahead. And so we um, worked with the administration and, and uh, talking to the union, union about the possibility of a K-8 uh, days where November 18th, which was yesterday, and December 2nd, that they would have an opportunity to begin to plan for if and when we go remote. Um, as you may have remembered this year, the election day, we did not have uh, high school students come for various reasons, but you know, security is one big one. Uh, we didn't want students mixed in with the public and stuff like that. And so, and the, the public really needs the space in the, the high school to, to do the voting. So the high school um, had that day for professional development. And part of our learning again this year is that people just need some time, uh, elementary teachers, to, 
to plan for if and when we go remote. So that was the intent to give them that time. And I did reach out to the building principals today. And I don't want to go too detailed because it would take too much time. But I just want to highlight, if I could, some of the things that the buildings worked on today to give people an understanding of the importance of this day and the day that we'll be adding on as far as December 2nd. Um, so again, principals worked with their teachers to really look at resources that they can use for when they're going to go remote. Again, I say if they do, I, I think it could happen at some point in time. And that the staff was very appreciative of the time. They work collaboratively in teams and um, the hybrid teachers were there and they were sort of the experts to work with our, um, on how remote teachers could, could build in collaboration and resources and knowledge for all staff. So that was a great way to, to have the hybrid teachers begin to learn about what remote learning could look like because um, we have people who are actually doing the remote learning now. Um, in one building, they did a survey just to kind of get a pulse of how people felt about, you know, are they prepared to go to a transition of being fully remote? And um, it was good data for that building. About 60% said that they agreed or strongly agreed that they're ready. And then other people said, you know, we're getting there, but we need more time and we need to have the time and resources to uh, get to the point where they felt really comfortable about it. Um, at another building, people felt very valuable about the essential learning goals that they wanted to cover this year. And they were talking about analyzing the fall and mathematics and reading by reading data by grade level and the content areas. And, how, and they use that data to begin to learn about the resources that they have been using with a distance learning playbook. Um, and it's a, a, a ability, it's a way to pace and, and guide the upcoming units. And um, again, that particularly work was very useful with, with that building. And um, a lot of good conversations came out of how can we work remotely? And uh, much of this work is trying to, to learn from each other. In another building, they mentioned how they went back to what the summer work was with the start team and the recommendations that came out of that plan. And they, uh, again, just kind of began to think about where we started with that team and that plan and where we can go. And they really dug into the resources with distance learning and um, it was energizing and it gave people just a time to really learn from each other, which is, as you know, as a classroom teacher, you're always on the go and there's very little downtime to be able to really collaborate and learn from your peers. So people were very appreciative of this time. Um, I think if you talk to any educator, you know, it was a good start in the perfect world. If we had even more time, uh, people would find it even more valuable. So I just wanted to highlight that because we, we wanted to make sure people knew that we don't want people to get in a panic mode to think we're going remote anytime soon. We don't know when and if that will happen, but we need time for our educators to plan. And um, they took good advantage of that yesterday, and they'll be doing that on December 2nd. That's the update on that. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised for questions. Does anyone have anything? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, thank you very much, Sandy, for giving us an update. And I know that that time is appreciated by our staff. So hopefully everyone will feel comfortable um, if the situation does arise. Uh, Lisha, I just saw your hand pop up. Sorry, I couldn't find it, so I was waving at you. 
Um, no worries. The, for these days, does that are, are they are the um, waiver days only for snow days, or is, or will these be covered under the waiver days? Can you say that again, Alicia. I'm sorry. Um, these days, these K through eight days, will that count towards the minimum required days, or is that in a the waiver period that you were just talking about with Sarah? This is a waiver period. It yeah. is. I didn't know if the waiver period included these types of planning days or if it was just snow days. Thank you. Yep. Great, okay. I'm not seeing any other questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, agenda item 6.0 is our professional contract update. I will turn this over to our negotiations chair, um, Nick. Nick, you're on mute. There we go. Oh, good. Now you'll never know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I just want to take some time to actually, in, in public and in our board meeting, uh, go over the four MOUs that we ratified at our last board meeting. So um, the board negotiations team worked with the SCA negotiations team to settle and ratify what came to be four separate MOUs, one for each of the four units that I listed here, who are represented by the Scarborough Education Association. Um, it was all kind of done as one comprehensive effort, but in the end, it made more sense logistically because each contract is a separate document and an MOU is an official addendum to that collective bargaining agreement to have four separate agreements. And they're all very closely related. And so um, I'm actually gonna go through them one by one, but what's nice is that if we start with the professional teachers um, and professional staff and teachers contract, you'll see that that's the one that has the most comprehensive elements to it. And then from there, it kind of pairs down uh, based on what's in the contract of the other groups and what's relevant to their positions. I did want to also say that all of the MOUs will be available on the SPS website, uh, along with the current CBAs in uh, due course very soon. Next. Thank you. So I, I hate wordy slides, I apologize for this, but uh, there's just a lot to cover. So I, I tried to make it as legible as possible. So this is um, the first MOU is for our professional staff and our teachers, professional staff or folks for the people that don't know, are folks like our nurses, um, our, our clinical, our social workers and folks like that. Um, so I wanted to go through the, the big kind of take homes from the MOU. Remember that the MOU, as I said a moment ago, is an addendum to the contract. So everything that's in the contract that's not addressed here still applies for the duration of that agreement. So um, sick leave, we did agree, and you'll see this in all four, to add 10 days beyond the, the federally kind of granted emergency sick time that came out through the FFCRA. Um, and this is an additional 10 days on top of that, that the person can use if they are, have to take a COVID related absence from work, that's something that happened at a school. So um, there, of course, there are situations where that 10 days wouldn't be applicable. In other words, if somebody was exposed and had to quarantine because they flew to St. Louis for a concert, I don't know why I picked St. Louis, but I did. They flew uh, there for a concert, something of their own personal choice, then they wouldn't be able to make use of those 10 days. And that's worded very specifically in the MOU. But this is for you know, a school related exposure. And if they have to quarantine for 10 days, um, and if it happens more than once, that first 10 days would be the FFCRA. But if it happened again, which you know, with with you know, COVID's a scary thing, right? Um, we didn't want it, they, they didn't really want it to impact their earned sick time and the board negotiations group did agree to that and we ratified it last week. So you'll see that clause in all four of the MOUs. Talking about grievances, grievances is something that's already in the contract. However, um, there was some discussion about um, adding a piece in about rapid response. So uh, what that came down to is that any concerns that are brought up related to safety or, or issues around COVID, um, well, health and safety, 
uh, must be addressed within 24 hours. And what addressed means is that there has to be a plan in place and that has to be clearly communicated to the person who expressed the concern. Of course, there are going to be some things that come up that we can't just turn around on a dime and address it, but there'll be a plan in place, there'll be a mitigation strategy there. And so that's clearly uh, written in the MOU. As far as work schedule, um, this really was to structure how requests for remote work will be handled and accommodated. Uh, of course, I wanted to make this very clear. This is outside of ADA, the, America, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act. If there is a legitimate um, disability, COVID or not, we are required to give reasonable accommodations um, to meet that. So this particular clause dealt mostly with things that are outside of ADA and requests for remote work and how those will be processed and handled in a fair and consistent way. Uh, differential compensation has to do with our uh, stipends for people that run clubs, sports. Um, you know, if there's something that's canceled because of COVID and there's an alternative way of doing it, the amount of the stipend will be calculated exactly as it's listed in the CBA. And so if it has to be recalculated because the nature of the contact with the students, the nature of the opportunity has changed, then that would follow the stipend that are the stipend rubric that already exists. There is an additional piece in there that if there is a dispute that arises, there is a, a, a clause to create an appeals committee um, in the case that uh, there is a dispute between the parties about the amount that comes out of the, the rubric. Meet and consult is language you see all through many of the CBAs. And basically what that comes down to is that if there are changes to the Scarborough Public Schools COVID-19, I didn't want to call it reopening plan because we're open. So the plan as to how we operate and work in COVID, if there's a plan for that, the SEA groups just ask, this particular group asks that we meet and consult. And you'll see that in some of the other ones as well. And just get the perspective of those folks before making a final decision. Technical support, you'll see this in all of them. Basically, if there are certain things that come up um, as a result of distance learning or something that is related to COVID that, that impacts someone's um, job or what they're doing, we just ask, the groups ask that they receive training for that. And then the last piece is the most tricky and it was one of the ones that we had to work kind of really um, carefully on and that is um, pay. So there was a lot of discussion about a lot of the additional efforts that have gone into preparing and continuing to accommodate um, education and schools right now in, in the world of an evolving world of COVID-19. And so what we were able to do is we were able to, to access some of our COVID relief funds and actually offer our, our professional and teacher staff up to 11 hours of time at the volunteer rate. So that's $25 an hour, regardless of your seniority or what your current salary is. They can put in for that time, there is a federal form for it, um, and they can receive up to 11 hours of additional pay for planning in the, in the case that we go completely online, um, but also for just accommodating all the additional steps that everyone's having to take way outside and above and beyond to accommodate the world of education as we're currently experiencing it. Does anyone have any questions about that one before? I mean, we can, I can do them all or we can stop and people can ask about this one if you want, but maybe hearing them all might be better. I don't know. What do you think, April? I'm not seeing any hands, Nick, so I would say keep on going. All righty. This is the same, ver uh, different flavor of the same thing, but you'll notice there's just one um, that's missing. And so um, the, really the change here is at the very bottom you will see that um, because these are educational support staff and they're hourly employees, um, they are going to get paid not at, a, at, the, um, at the volunteer rate, as it's stated in the professional contract, but at their per diem rate for up to four hours of approved time that they allocate to assisting teachers. The example that came up in the discussions was, you know, if there's additional photocopying that has to happen and that educational technician has some additional time or has time outside of their contracted work week, they could use, they could put in for this time and get additional pay for support that they're doing um, to help teachers. Uh, the rest of these read pretty much exactly the same. Next. You'll see the list gets smaller. Um, and I, I found a, a picture of a female bus driver, which I just thought was really cool because uh, I like putting pictures on slides because words are annoying. Um, but all these are essentially the same. Um, you'll see that uh, meet and consult is still here. Grievances are still here. Technical support is still here. Um, uh, we did have a discussion about additional pay for the bus drivers and the group you're going to see in a moment. 
The reason those clauses didn't come in here is because um, they're hourly employees um, and actually addi any additional hours that they're working, they're already getting paid for. Um, so the ed tech one was a little bit special because that was specifically about helping teachers above and beyond their, their standard job. Um, but uh, with, with the bus drivers in the next group you're gonna see, there was no uh, reason to put an additional pay. Um, but the rest of the clauses are the same. And then this one is literally identical except there's a picture of a female custodian as opposed to a female bus driver. So I just wanted to go over those in public. Um, and um, really it came down to the kind of take home for all of these was that we really kept them um, streamlined to things that either weren't in the contract and things that were not covered by federal law or the main CDC or the EPA, all the different things that have come out to help us with COVID. We didn't want to have to replicate that language in the contract. We really wanted to make sure these MOUs spoke specifically to things that belonged in a collective bargaining agreement um, that were uh, relevant to COVID. All of these are set to expire either at the end of the current contract year, or if we, God willing, before then, go back to life pre-COVID and no longer have to be thinking about these things. That's, that's my update. Excellent, Nick. Thank you so much for following through with those. Um, and I also pre appreciate your um, thoroughness to, from following it all the way through, making sure they got signed and then also making sure that they got posted as well. So all of those are publicly available and um, you know that it's, it's the result of a lot of hours of work, I know. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions before we move on? Seeing none. Uh, agenda item 7.0 is the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium update. Um, and for this one, I'm going to turn it over to Shannon um, as she was uh, as she volunteered for us um, at the last meeting to take the initial call. Sure, absolutely. First, um, thank you, Diane, for organizing this meeting. I really found it to be incredibly insightful and helpful for me to understand and really wrap my arms around um, what the Mid-Atlantic um, equity consortium could do for us here in Scarborough. So thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for allowing me, April, to, to participate. Um, the big takeaway I, I had from this is that any programming or any um, recommendations we get, this is not going to be a cookie cutter approach here in Scarborough. What they do is they, um, they gather data points from three different ways that I'll talk about in just a moment. And once they gather that data and they have an opportunity to go look through it, they would then come to us with recommendations for what we would need based on what they see in Scarborough. So um, for the questions of, are we going to have a forum or should we do this or should we have a, an in-service day? We don't know yet because they really have to go through the, their process first. Um, the data is collected. They have a three-prong approach. They do climate surveys um, is part one, or is one leg, I should say, not part one. Um, those are based on, are done via SurveyMonkey. They are sent out to four different groups. Um, they break elementary school students out. Um, they start at grade three because they, um, the thought process is K to two just does not have the cognitive ability to answer questions of this magnitude. So they, th they find that um, grade three is where they really can start answering questions. Um, so grade three to, to um, up to whatever we stop is what she said. They typically run through six, but as we know, our grade six is, is middle school. So it would, it would run up from grade through on. There's a middle school and high school student survey that is combined grades. There's a staff survey, and then there is a parent survey. Um, I specifically asked if we can gear this more towards the community. And her response was that um, we could do that. She said, what, would might, we, what we might see is that community members that don't have a tie to the school might not see that there's a need for them to answer the survey. So if you look at the um, samples that I sent you, there is one on there that said um, it was a parent survey. Um, we, could, we could manipulate that wording if we wanted to. She just said to be aware that people who don't have that connection might not answer the survey. So we might not see results there. Um, the, the other note she did say about the climate surveys um, is that there is a worry because of COVID that um, some of the children that answer that what she has seen or what they have seen 
is that there might be a little bit more negativity than what we would see in a normal when we were doing, you know, business as usual and going to school. And it's just a, a, a byproduct of the environment we're in with COVID. Um, the political environment she mentioned as well has added to that. So she just wanted to let us know that that is something to be aware of. And that later on, we could even do another survey if we wanted to check the temperature at a later date that was possible. So that's prong one. Um, prong two is an equity audit that's done. Um, and there are three levels of that as well. Um, they are self-assessed, so it's a little bit of a different type of audit. Um, one is at the building level, one is at the classroom level, and one is at the teacher level. So again, um, just as a refresher from last week, the purpose of um, MAEC or why, the, why they um, are here is to really be sure that there is equitable education for everybody. Um, everybody is able to succeed in school and um, the, the purpose of the audits is to be sure that these that everybody has that opportunity in school to succeed and to do well with the same resources. The teacher level is a self reflection um, that that they would do to examine their own practices. So that's going to be um, an interesting an interesting thing to look at as well as at the building level. Um, included in that are our administrators, of course, other teachers and staff, and then non-teaching staff members. And then the third prong is focus groups. So that would be um, stakeholders that we as the board would identify to participate in the, in the focus groups. Um, examples would include teachers, parents, uh, students as well, um, to where they could, uh, this would be an opportunity for the uh, community to be heard. So um, that, that is the, the bonus there as well. Um, so again, they're going to collect that data and then um, MAEC will make a recommendation as to what we need. What we need. So some examples that she gave, she said we might find that we need professional staff training on how to speak up when a staff, how a staff member should speak up when they witness bullying or witness racism. Um, they, she's found um, sometimes what they find through the surveys is that their teachers are just unsure of how to approach the, the topic. So it might be something like that. It might be that we have training on privilege that we base in the community. So she said, those are just examples, but again, nothing concrete until we go through this pronged approach and we determine, or, or they determine and recommend what they think um, that Scarborough needs, the needs for Scarborough. Um, the other thing she recommended is that we create a steering committee. The purpose of that would be to really um, hear the programming recommendations from MAEC and, re and relay that back to the board. Um, the group would be rep sh should be representative, she said, of the different communities and the different stakeholders involved. Um, one question I know Alicia brought up last meeting was she wanted to know about the funding, and we did talk a lot about that. Um, it's, this is run through the Department of Education and the funding actually comes from um, Title IV of the Civil Rights Act. So um, nothing, this programming, there's no, there's no funding that comes from it that is outside of the, that um, Department of Education funding. Now, if we wanna continue on with them and do additional work, things like a full curriculum review, we would pay a fee for that. So that, that would cost us um, money out of the budget, but the, the three-pronged approach I explained to you, the recommendations that they would bring forth and the activities that we would participate in or potentially participate in are included in that, that Department of Education funding. Um, what I, the other thing that stuck out to me is I don't, ever, I don't claim to be an expert. I know um, we're looking really at this group because they are the experts. Um, our consultant, I was very impressed with her experience. She's had 30 years in education and law and equity work. So she is um, definitely well-versed um, in this topic and in the subject matter. And really, um, to me, it, 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 there's a good fit there. I, I appreciated everything she brought to the table and that she, she, told, she explained to us. I think we have a good opportunity here to do some listening and some learning. Great, thank you, Shannon. Does anyone have any questions? Max, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, um, first off, I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm really glad that our district is heading in this direction. Um, I really liked everything that you had to say. I just had a question regarding like 
the surveys you mentioned, um, could you give me any examples on like the types of questions that they would ask? Because I know you had said like um, they don't survey like K through two because they don't really have like the cognitive functioning to answer those questions. So specifically at like the third grade level and even at like the staff level, like at all levels, what kind of questions will they be asking? Sure, yeah, they had um, at the lower levels, it was questions like, um, I feel that the teachers in the school are, want me to do my best. I feel like the teachers encourage me to do my work. I'm proud of my school. I'm proud to learn in school. Um, there were some questions as well as, um, I, do I feel safe in school? And it's on a um, strongly agree to a strongly disagree scale. So they're just, you know, bubbling in on SurveyMonkey how they, how they feel. Um, questions about safety rules are in there. Um, questioning questions about bullying. If if my teacher sees bullying, they they'll say something about it. Those those types of questions are in there. Um, my friends and, and I feel safe. We feel like we're respected in the school. Um, so it really runs the gamut, quite honestly. That's awesome. Um, you had said like there would be a lot of self reflection for teachers. Do you know what kind of um, insight or like questions they ask of the teachers in that stage? Well, we do have a sample about of the audit. Um, the one thing we have to be careful of with that is that the audit is actually undergoing um, a revamping right now process. So what it looks like right now today is not necessarily what it's going to look like when it's our, our opportunity to do it. Um, so that is, it, it, yes, I've got one and I can be, uh, generally say that the questions are in line with, um, uh, what I just at what I just told you, um, but the the survey, the this equity piece is going to really talk about does the school have policies? What does my education programming look like? How what does my teaching program look like? What does my curriculum look like? Is it um, do the hallways show equ equitable? Um, in regards to gender and identity, are we showing equitable pictures in the hallways and on the bulletin boards? And are we making sure that we're integrating our classroom when students self-segregate? You know, it, it's really diving into um, the minutia of what's happening in the school all the way down to the curriculum level. So it's pretty robust. Um, I just, again, I just um, say that that piece of it is one we have to, um, we know is going to change. I don't, I don't anticipate that it's going to be a major change. She didn't indicate so, but it, it will look a little bit different. Diane, go ahead. And then Alicia, you're up next. Yeah, I was also just going to add, I think, you know, Shannon's done a great job describing what that, um, you know, conversation that we had with Michelle Nutter was. Um, I think the other piece that I would just add is, to take into account that these are surveys that have been considered reliable and valid because they've been used across the United States by the Department of Ed on a regular basis. So it's not a homegrown survey that's just being tested out and that we're not sure is gonna get us the information that we need. So I really loved that aspect of it as well. Alicia, go ahead. Actually, Diane's um, statement was is related to my question. That I thought that the questions looked really good, the sample questions that were sent. One of the concerns or that I were or questions I asked myself was about the context that the kids are getting these surveys. And I was um, a little bit concerned about that because um, I just wondered if if they would understand the the reason for for their answers and why their answers are important. So if if you were asked if you feel safe in the school today to a third grader, they might think about COVID, for example, and not that that's not obviously important and relevant, but we're you know we've got a specific goal that we're trying to achieve, and I just wondered if that was something that they discussed at all. Well, that is definitely um, in line with what she was, Michelle was, uh, Michelle, our consultant was saying um, in regard to the negativity that they're seeing in the surveys right now and that we can expect just given the climate that we're in. Um, 
so yes, we're going to have to temper the results a little bit under with the understanding that we are, these are not normal times that we're in. Um, and so the answers will reflect that. She did say um, that we could go back and do it again later, do the survey again later when things are normal so that we can get a better understanding um, during, during a, a normal school year, if you will. We, we could go back and see what that looks like at that time. We could resurvey. I guess I just wondered if like the teachers give context when they when they give these yeah. surveys to the kids. So like if a third grader gets that, do, do they have some context? Yeah, and the only other thing I would add to that is remember it's an overall climate survey. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of just getting a sense of how does each person feel in the environment that they're in? And then, you know, part of the disaggregation of the data has to do with how those, um, there's my dog again, sorry. Um, how, those, how those individuals self-identify, right? And so if I self-identify as a, you know, having a certain ethnicity, my results get aggregated with that group. And that's how we begin to start pulling apart, you know, do different groups feel differently in our environment? Interesting, thank you. Before you call it Gabby, I just want to say we're testing out this remote sound system. So you may need to give us some of that. Okay, fair enough. Go ahead, Gabby. Oh, you're still on mute, Gabby. Sorry. Okay. So um, thank you for doing this. And also, I, I know Diane just mentioned ethnicity is a part of like identifying is it gender or what other types of like identifying questions that's a great question yes it is it's um ethnicity it's gender identity um the school you currently attend would be on there your grade level um race and language at home okay perfect thank you Do students say who they are when they fill out the survey or is it anonymous? Um, it's anonymous. Okay. Yeah, we would just know those um, ident the, that identifying information, age, ethnicity, gender identity, school. Shannon, thank you again for attending the call and for taking such um, diligent notes, which, you know, for for the public's reference were typed and sent to the full board. So we had a record of that call um, last week even. Um, and so we've all had an opportunity to review that. Um, the next thing I think we need to consider as a board um, is really for us is, is this something we wanna pursue? Um, later on in the agenda, there is an action item for us to enter into an MOU, um, if that is the direction that um, the board wants to go. But before we move on to action items and, and whatnot, I wanted to make sure that we had a thorough discussion. Um, it sounds to me, Shannon, like the next step for us as a board might be to start thinking about forming the steering committee. Is that would you say that's accurate or do we wait and, and form a steering committee later on down the line? Um, I think we could do simultaneously the steering committee and um, get started on the three prong approach because really the steering committee is going to hear the recommendations from, from the equity consortium. And um, so there's going to be some lapse in time for lack of a better phrase, right? Cause we're going to have to wait for the data to come in um, and we have to, we um, would need to do our part in identifying who what the stakeholders would be, who we want to participate in the audit audits. So there's some work for us to do as well um, prior to. So it would either be us or yes, if you wanted it to be the steering committee, but I do believe they could be simultaneously done or started. Okay, Sarah. Um, thank you, Shannon, for the breakdown and, and all the information. I, I might be putting the cart before the horse here a little bit, but I've just been like mulling Alicia's point about context and framing, which I think is really important. Um, and I'm wondering if, should we decide to 
enter into a contract or a MOU with them and move forward with the, the three-pronged approach, so the climate surveys. Would it be, and maybe this is a question to go back to them, but I wonder if it would be in our interest to send some sort of communication out uh, stating that we have entered into this MOU with them and like why and what the goals of it are and that uh, one of the next steps is that students will be receiving some survey just to kind of provide some sort of framing. Mm -hmm. I don't know, just thought. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think the other thing, the other piece of it is um, uh, the surveys would be optional as well. So if, if there was a student that didn't, couldn't, um, you know, cognitively understand the survey or didn't know why they were taking it or if it bothered them or upset them, they would certainly not be required to take it. So there is there is that piece too, but I definitely think communication around it is a great idea. Max? Is my hand still up? It was not on purpose. Oh, it is. Sorry, I, <laughs> Sorry. Thought it, I thought it had gone down, so I thought that was a new one. Sorry. So in the past, when we've, um, you know, needed a, a kind of pop-up committee, we've discussed as a board a timeline um, for getting something like that done. We've put out a request for applicants to the community. And then we could certainly, um, you know, move that along and decide as a board what the criteria were for how many people we thought should be on the committee and what the representation was going to be. Um, you know, I'm looking at the calendar now and I want to set realistic um, goals for us. Our next meeting is December 3rd, which, you know, with the Thanksgiving holiday um, being right smack in the middle of that. Um, I think that if we were to put out a application for committee members, that certainly a deadline that was more in line with our December 17th meeting, um, I think would give respondents time to apply. Um, and then we could go from there. Um, I'm certainly open to other opinions on how people would like to move forward if we do want to form a steering committee. I just don't want this conversation to go by and then decide two weeks from now, oh shoot, we should have gotten started with the applicant process. Sarah? It, um, do we have a recommendation from them on who the steering committee, how the steering committee should be formed, like what type of stakeholders should be on it? Um, yes, she, she, and she's aware of our um, civil rights group and our, our anti-racism group. So her recommendation was we have representatives from each um, board, uh, board member to um, administration, teachers, and com a few community members. So not, not, um, I, she didn't it, it divulge a number, but certainly she, you know, that we have a cross representation essentially. I think by the sounds of it, you know, if we did decide to enter into an MOU with them this evening, um, you know, then they are there to guide us. Mm -hmm. um, and so certainly as we were forming our steering committee, even if we just wanted to, you know, ask that question, mm -hmm. you know, if they would be able to guide us as we, as we started that process. Yeah, she's um, absolutely, I, I feel confident in saying she'd absolutely guide us. Um, this might be a dumb question, but what does a steering committee do? So the steering committee, um, well, uh, from this perspective, I, I'll let April speak in general, but to, for this perspective, her thoughts, Michelle, um, our consultant, her thoughts were that um, they would take in the recommendations from the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. They would take them in from them and then they would relay them to us on the board with their ideas about the recommendations moving forward. Okay, so like if you're going to put out like a request or like a um, a way for people to apply to be on the steering committee, would it be possible for it to be like stressed or like asked that we have a lot of or like BIPOC 
applicants, like encouraging them to apply? Because I, my fear would be that it would be all white people, which I don't think is going to be productive. I'm not sure how to answer you, so I'm going to look to April for, for that. <laughs> and, and, and this is where I fully own that I don't know how to answer that yeah. either, Max. And I'm hoping that entering into an agreement, this is where this is where the experts come in, right? This is where we say, how do we generate the best steering committee that we can in our mm -hmm. community? And they will be able to advise us on how to move forward. I do appreciate awesome. your thoughtfulness, Max. I think it's, yeah. I, I mean, I appreciate every, I think this whole process has been very thoughtful and I think that's the right way to go about it. So I appreciate it. Sarah, is that an old hand or a new hand? Old hand. <laughs> Does anyone else have any comments or questions they wanna ask? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So um, I think to kind of tie up the conversation, um, we can certainly use the information from this conversation to decide on our action item um, once we get into new business. Um, and depending on how that vote goes, I think part of the discussion can certainly be moving forward. Now, what's, what would they say our next step is and, and how to engage? Um, and we can, you know, let them guide us as Max pointed out, because, you know, I don't want to put together a steering committee, um, you know, that isn't going to be, the, that isn't going to arrive at the results that we're, that we're looking for. Okay. So moving on. Agenda item 8.0 is a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 4056D for the purposes of discussing collective bargaining agreements to return to public session. So moved. Second. Second. Diane, could you take a vote, please? Sure. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cavallonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftis? Yes. Okay, everyone, you have a link to the executive session um, in your email. It's 823 and we've been at this since 530. So I am going to suggest that we convene executive session at 830, please. <laughs> okay, I'll see you all there. And we will be back for those of you who are in the public. 